Good morning, good afternoon or good evening, depending on where you are. I'm Jackie Lynch and I want to thank you for taking the time to listen to this session. For those of you that don't know me, I've been working in IT on the system side for over 42 years. The last 27 have been primarily in power and I specialize in AIX, VIO servers, Linux and some performance. Of that time, some of it was spent as a customer, about 22 years, and the rest has been a mix of consulting and working for business partners. So in this session, this is part two of our three-part VIO server series, we're going to be focusing on backup and recovery, some storage, a little bit on the network, and more material on monitoring. In particular, backup and recovery is one of the things that people tend to forget for their VIO servers, and it's very, very important. So one of the first things I want to tell you about is what the supported backup and restore methods are for VIO servers. There is some confusion because you can install a VIO server from the USB flash image that IBM provides. However, you are not able to backup and restore your VIO server to a USB stick. The only supported methods are tape, DVD, remote file system, and Tivoli Storage Manager. So that's something that you need to be aware of when you're planning for your backup and restore my strategies. In order to take a backup, you need to be able to use the backup iOS command. You don't use a typical SMIDI makes this be. Now the VIO server version of VIOS upgrade when you're doing an upgrade will take an extra backup for you, but that is a backup of the virtualization. So think about you know all the VFC map commands and everything you do, it keeps track of that. That is a different kind of a backup to actually backing up the VIO server with the equivalent of a makes us be that you can restore from. One of the other things that it can be recommended to do as well is that just in case you have a problem, you may want to take a snap before you do your backup so that if you have any issues in the next few days, you've got a snap of before any changes were made. In order to take a backup, you need to run backup iOS as pAdmin. One of the things that I've found is if you're using a media library or file-backed optical, you need to make sure that you use the dash no media lib flag to make sure it does not back up the media library, particularly if your media library is in root VG. Otherwise, you will end up with an enormous backup. What I have found is that sometimes that doesn't work, so I actually unmount slash var slash viovm library before I run the backup iOS command. That what that does is it takes care of taking the backup uh, and basically doing like a Maxis B equivalent. Now, there's two different kinds of backups. The first kind of backup is this one that I have listed here, where I'm doing a backup iOS minus file to a file name. And that backup is going to do a backup that will actually create a NIM resources tar package, because what I'm providing here with the VIOS A is actually a directory. And what happens with that tar package is I can then use that to upload to the HMC and I can restore my VIO server from the HMC. Alternatively, I can take a backup to a makes this be file, and, which is what the dash makes this be flag does, and that gives me a makes this be file that I can then use to restore from, whether I restore use it with NIM or however. Now, most of us want to script these kind of things. So when I script it, one of the things that I do is I will write a script and in that script it will say su minus p admin minus c and then I will put the actual command that I want to run as if I was p admin inside of that shell. Without that you can't really run scripts in order to be able to do your backups. One of the things that you're going to want to do is set up your system to automatically backup all your virtual settings. You do not want to lose those. If you run the viosbr command the way that I have it here with a dash backup a file name and a frequency daily num file 7, what that will do is it will set up a cron job that every day will take a backup of all your virtualization settings and it will keep the last seven. As I mentioned, there are two different backup types after that, the makes this be and the backup for NIM slash HMC. Both of those are done to an NFS mount, so you need to have somewhere to put them. When I do those backups, I do both of them because that gives me the most options for doing restores. So just keep that in mind. Now the backups used to be really huge. Uh, I Even without the media library, they would be like 30, 40 gig. 
I'm finding now that with 31125, my backups are a little smaller. However, because of how it does the backup and how it compresses it later, whatever the size of your backup is, you need at least twice that much storage free. So my two VIO servers, they take about 38 gig when they're completely backed up, but I need to have at least 80 gig free while I'm doing the backup because I take both kinds of backups. So the backup script that I run is pretty simple. It checks the machine name. I happen to have a directory called user local backups. That is an NFS mount. And so one of the first things that I do is obviously I mount it. I unmount my virtual library, the file-backed optical library. And then I will SU to pAdmin and run the first backup, which is the one that will be used by the HMC if I need it. And then I run the second backup, which is the MakesSB. It's a very simple script. You can basically use it to run a monthly backup if you want. If you want, you can have a zero version and a one version. So you can take two backups a month or you know, a backup on the 15th, a backup on the 30th, and then they can override each other. You can put dates in it. You can get very fancy with it. I don't like filling up my backup file system, so I just um, have a couple of them. So I mentioned that the VIOSBR with the num files creates virtual definition backups. You can actually check what's in there by either using the VIOSBR-view command, or you can actually do an ls on the directory, which is slash home slash padmin slash config backups. You only run that VIOSBR command once, and from then on it puts a cron job in and you can see that that cron job is going to run every day. When you go to check the backups, you can see here I have a VIOS name.01 through.07 are those automated backups. And VIOS name is just the name I told it to give them. It can be anything you want. And as you can see, when you do the ls-al on the directory, you see the same thing. You also want to check your backups. So in my case, I have it set up that all my MaxSB backups go to a directory called vio maxsbs so I can do an ls and I can do a du and make sure that my backup is really where I expect it to be. And then for the NIM resources one, they go into a different directory. So here I'm checking my vio2 backup directory to make sure that my NIM resources tar file is there, that the date matches, and that it looks like it's about the right size, which it is. I have a script that I run where I run a bunch of VIO commands and I write them out, the output to a save directory, and then I copy those off to another system. And I do that because if my VIO SBR fails or if something goes wrong, I at least know what the setup is for all of my systems. Obviously, you would need to tweak this for yourself. For instance, ENT9 might not be your SEA, so you might want to instat something else. Um, you also might want to add a whole lot of commands to this. So think of it as making your VIO server self-document. And you could run this as a cron job once a day. You could run it as a cron job once a month. Or you could just run it whenever you're making changes. Either way, I find that this I find particularly useful. And this is just a list of the files that it creates for me, just to give you an idea. We're going to talk a little bit about storage because storage and understanding storage and particular zoning and mapping is very important with VIO servers and it's critically important when you start to do things with live partition mobility. So we'll start with a fairly basic picture because it's important to understand the difference between virtual SCSI, NPIV or Nport ID virtualization. So in the case of virtual SCSI, the VIO server owns the fiber channel adapters, the disks get zoned and mapped to those fiber adapters, and the VIO server owns all of the disks. It then uses the mapping command to map those individual disks to each LPAR. So you need to keep a spreadsheet of every disk that the VIO server owns and which LPAR it's attached to. Some people actually rename the disks so that they don't get confused. I find the best way is just to keep a spreadsheet that says, you know, HDisk3 is, is um, client ABC, dash root VG or, or whatever. But you need to keep track of those. So that's one of the reasons why people aren't particularly fond of vSCSI because if you have a system with an awful lot of disks, you have an awful lot of disks to keep track of. Import virtualization, on the other hand, actually does a pass-through. Basically, we actually zone the client worldwide port number, which is going to be at the actual client LPAR. We actually create that in the profile. 
and the disc actually gets passed all the way through to the client LPAR. So there is no handling of that disk by the VIO servers. It's just a pass-through mechanism. So a couple of things you need to be aware of. Obviously, vSCSI has a bit more CPU overhead because the VIO server is handling all that I.O. versus NPIV, which has the pass-through mechanism. However, with NPIV, you are required to use a SAN switch, and that SAN switch has to be NPIV enabled. In both cases, the way that you do zoning and LUN masking, which I also call mapping, is very important. The first thing I want to do is make sure that people understand the difference between zoning and mapping, because there's a lot of confusion about them. So zoning is when the switch is configured to allow the switch port to talk to the storage and the WWPN for the LPAR or server. So basically, we would, if we're zoning at the switch, we tell the switch, this is the worldwide port numbers for the, switch, for the storage, and this is the worldwide port numbers for the LPAR that you, or server that you're going to talk to. And that's the only conversations that it will allow through that switch port. Now, that is not the same thing as mapping and masking. Mapping and masking is when I go to my storage subsystem and I create all my LUNs. And then for, those, for each of those LUNs, I tell the storage subsystem which worldwide port numbers can have access to them. You need to do both of those in order to be able to have end-to-end -end connectivity for the storage. The LUNs have got to be provisioned at the storage, then you map them, then you go to the switch and you zone them before they can be used in an LPAR. When you're direct attaching for vSCSI, we zone and we map the WWNs for the real adapters. So that would be the adapters that we see inside of the VIO server versus what we would do for NPIV, where we use the virtual adapter worldwide port numbers. The way you can tell the difference is a WWN tends to start with a 10 or a 20. A WWPN for MPIV will start with a C0. Uh, if you run an HMC scanner report or you log into the LPAR or VIO or the HMC, you can find most of these. You also need to make sure that your switch is NPIV enabled. This is done with the LSN ports command. So here you can see the output that shows me which fabric my adapters are connected to and shows me that I can actually see some NPIV enabled ports. It's really important you don't confuse zoning with mapping or masking. As I said, the WWPNs have got to be zoned at the switch and mapped or masked at the storage. If you don't do that, then they can't talk. And that's where I see a lot of issues. Every virtual fiber adapter for an LPAR is going to have two worldwide port numbers if you're using MPIV. The first one is the default one that is used. If you are using LPM, then it will also use the second one when you do migrations, but it flip-flops between them when you're using LPM. So what's really, really important when you want to use LPM, or if you want to design for LPM, is that you need to zone and map both of those WWPNs. If you never intend to use LPM, you only have to zone and map the first one. If, you do, if they're not mapped at the storage, or they're not zoned properly, and you do an LPM, you're going to damage your boot image. There's some ways to, to avoid that once you get to VIO Server 224, which you should be on version 3 by now. And there's a couple of parameters called VIO SLPM0 um, that you can use on the VIO Server LPARs to force it to do an end-to-end -end check. Those do slow things down, but they can be useful with validation. I also try to keep my zoning very, very simple. I see some incredibly complex zoning on switches, and the problem is that with LPM, we'll pick which FCS it's going to put the worldwide port numbers on. So the problem that you run into is people tend to do, you know, LPAR underscore FCS underscore adapter address or whatever as a zone name. That doesn't work well with LPM. What you're going to end up wanting to do, and I'll show you a simple zoning in a few minutes, is zone all the WWPNs for the LPAR to both switches. Then there's no confusion. LPM will work, and you won't run into the kind of problems you run into when you f don't get it right. With vSCSI, we're going to use the WWN for the VIO server. That's the one that starts with a 10. And if you do an Alice config vplfcs 0 and grep network, you're going to see something that looks like the number that I have there. Those belong to the VIO. Anything that is zoned and mapped to that can only be seen by the VIO. It can then pass it through using mappings with vSCSI, but the VIO is the one that will see these. In this case, all the MPIO drivers get installed in the VIO server, 
and you still mirror everything in the client outpath. Any fiber adapter tunables will be set in the VIO. Uh, conversely with MPIV, we're going to use the WWPNs, the ones that are going to start with a C0, that are created when you create the client LPAR and you create the virtual fiber there. You go into the profile, look at the virtual adapters, and you should be able to see them there as you click on each virtual adapter. Like I said, each virtual adapter will have a pair of them. When you actually do an LPM, those WWPNs actually migrate with the client LPAR. The VIO does not see the disks, so you have to put the MPIO drivers into the client LPAR. The way that you look at them, instead of using LSMAP-ALL, which is how you see vSCSI, you have to use LSMAP-ALL minus MPIV. In the client LPAR, you will actually see FCS adapters, the same as you do in the VIO. If you decide to tune your fiber adapters, it's very important that whatever you set in the client LPAR must be less than or equal to whatever is set in the VIO servers. The VIO server must have been rebooted with those settings before you set them in the client LPAR. If you don't get the order right, the client LPAR won't boot. One of the other things we found with MPIV is there are some storage arrays, like the V5000, where you might have to zone the real WWNs for the adapters. You don't map the storage to it, you just zone them, not just the client WWPNs. I had mentioned doing a simple zoning. So here's my AIX1 LPAR, and on switch one, I've zoned the four virtual adapter WWPNs. I've zoned the storage that it needs to connect to WWPNs, and then I also zoned a tape adapter. The second switch, the things that are different are the storage and the two tape adapters. The actual WWPNs for the client LPAR are the same as they were above. This is really simple. It's very clear that this is for that particular LPAR, and then you don't have to stress over which fiber adapter you're going to zone, which WWPN, etc. to. And it also stops the confusion that you get when LPM does things like flip-flopping between the different WWPNs that it has. So with MPIV, one of the things that you're going to get asked by your storage people is to light up those adapter ports. And you also need to obviously know what they are. So one of the things that you can do is, there's multiple ways to do this. You can do it through the HMC, you can do it through the HMC GUI. So you can actually log on to the HMC and use the chain port login and actually tell it to log in all of the ports for LPAR3. Then they can do their zoning and mapping, and then you can log them back out. Uh, down the bottom of the page, you'll see a number of statuses. You can also use the LSN port login command to check the actual status of the worldwide port numbers to see if they have actually logged in. As I mentioned, there are multiple ways to find those WWPNs. From the HMC, I can actually bring up the virtual fiber channel adapter and you can see here that I can actually see the two WWPNs for that client. So I would need to, the top one, the, the one that ends 30 or 34 on the right, that's the one that would be used by default, and the 31 and 35 would only be used with LPM. You can also go into the client LPAR profile, select any one of them, and go to advanced, login, logout, fiber channel, and it actually gives you all of them. And you can then log them all in, you can log them all out, you can just look at them. So how do you map the uh, MPIV WWPNs? Well, when you create those virtual definitions and activate the VIO server, it basically creates a VFC host for every LPAR. So what you would need to do is keep track of all those VFC hosts and which LPAR they're assigned to. Then you're going to do a VFC map. So in my case, I am mapping adapter 20, sorry, adapter 17 to VFC host 20, which happens to be AIX test 1, and VFC host 20 is going to be mapped to fiber adapter uh, FCS 0. If I want to have four connections to AIX test 1, I need a VFC host for each connection. You do not take one VFC host and map it four times to FCS 0, 1, 2, and 3. You set up four adapters and you map them. What you're going to see with the client is there'll be some mappings from VIO1 and some mappings from VIO2. So if I'm on VIO2 and I do an LSDEV and look at my fiber adapter channels, you can see I've got two 8 gig ones and two 16 gig ones. The bottom two are actually my 10 gig network card and later on I'm going to tell you how to deal with that. I can then grip the network address 
So the ones that are in B8 and B9, those are my 8 gig ports. The ones that are in 75 and 76 are the two ports on my 16 gig fiber channel adapter. Those are going to be the two that I'm going to want to do zoning and mapping for for my storage. And the 8 gig ones I know are in there because we use those for tape. Then the last command, the reason I'm looking at those fiber channel adapters is I want to know which port those are in. So I can see that the 8 gig adapters are in slot C12, ports T1 and T2. I can see that the 16 gig ones are in slot C, port, adapter port C6, slots T1 and T2. And so that allows me to basically build documentation as to exactly which network address goes with which port, etc, etc. Now when I want to look at my actual MPIV mappings, I would do an outless map minus all minus MPIV and I can look for the specific client. So in this case, I can see that for GPFS1, it is LPAR number 13, it is VFC host 12 and 15, and the virtual adapter numbers are 120 and 123. I can then actually do an LS map command on the VFC host itself, and here you can see that 12 is logged in as FCS2, and that 15 is logged in as FCS3. So that's how my two mappings look out. And again, I can on the client, I can do an LS dev and grip on FCS. And here, you'll notice when I do the LS config on the FCS adapters, all of those worldwide port numbers start with C050, and that's because they're virtual fiber channel adapters. When I do a grip on FCS here, what I see is the virtual fiber channel adapter numbers. So you can see 100, 103, 120, and 123. And if you were to delve in any deeper, you would see that the, the 100 and 103 come from VIO1 and the 120 and the 123 come from VIO2. When you're doing vSCSI, you don't add the minus MPIV and it gets mapped to the vHost, which is what you set up when you set up a vSCSI mapping. So in this case here, you can see that for this L part number 10, my vHost number is 13 and my adapter number is 133. That's the virtual adapter. I have a virtual optical defined, which I called VTOP13, and I also have two H disks, H disk 9 and H disk 10, assigned to this LPAR. So this LPAR would see those two disks. I am passing through the whole disk. I am not using logical volumes. We talked a little bit about LPM earlier, and I mentioned the two worldwide port numbers. The fact that every fiber adapter, virtual fiber adapter, has two worldwide port numbers. As I mentioned, the first one's used by default. Once you do an LPM, when it gets to the target system, it will use the next WWPN. If you LPM back, it goes back to the default, or if you LPM somewhere else, it goes back to the default. Basically, it flip-flops between them. The only time that the WWPNs don't change is if you do an inactive LPM. So you shut the LPAR down and then move it while it's down. Then it will come back up with whatever the worldwide port numbers were that it used last. Now, I had mentioned that FCS4 and FCS5 were actually the 10 gig network ports on my network adapter. Because it's a converged adapter, those ports show up as both Ethernet and fiber adapter. And they will and you will get error messages on them, which is really annoying. One of the things that you can do if you plan to never use them as fiber adapter ports is you can actually disable them as fiber adapter ports. And you do that by basically doing an rmdev unconfigure and set them into a defined state. At that point, you'll no longer get error messages on those ports. And you can run ERRPT, run config manager, etc, etc. But at that point, you basically will no longer have the error messages that you used to get. So very quickly here, we're going to talk a little bit about HBA tuning. This is a present a session that could take an awful long time, so I'm just going to touch on it very briefly. There's two parameters on your fiber adapters that help with setting the equivalent of Q depth on the adapters. And Q depth is simply the number of in-flight IOs that you can have outstanding at any time. So by default on your fiber adapters, these numbers are pretty low. The default max transfer size is 0x100000, which is I think a 16 meg DMA. And num command alums, I think by default on a VIOs like 512, and on a client is either 200 or 256. What I typically do on my VIO servers is I bump both of those up 
The max transfer size by default is supposed to use a 128 meg DMA, which is what that 0x20 equates to, so I make sure that it actually does. And then num command alums I out increase depending on how many concurrent IOs I want and what the storage subsystem will support. But it could be anywhere from 1024 to 4096. And typically for me it's between 1024 and 2048, but it depends on your disk vendor, so you need to check. You should make the changes on your VIO servers and reboot your VIO servers before you change them on any of your clients, because the client must be set to either the same value or smaller than your VIO servers. Now, up until AIX 71 TL2, num command alums on your virtual fiber clients was limited to 256. After that, you are able to set it higher, and there's a couple of links here that you should have a look at, but you are able to set those higher. I always set the max transfer size as well. Max transfer size default is 16 meg. After that, you can, there's three different values you can set it to that get you 128 meg. And if you add an extra zero, it will look at the bus. You might get 256 meg or you might get 128 meg. That's why I never bother with anything greater than the 0x2, uh, 00000. There are some adapters that support very large max transfer sizes. I have never had to use them, but it's going to be obviously a, your workload dif differs. Unless you're really driving huge IOs, then we almost never change it beyond that 0x200, 000. So here's the default setting on one of my client LPARs. And as you can see, the max transfer size I changed to get my 128 meg DMA. And this was one that actually had a lot of IO, so I did change my num command alums. The change is done with ChDev, and typically when it's ChDev, that means you have to do a reboot to make it become active. So again, as I said, make sure your VIO servers are changed and rebooted first. And then make sure that when you do your clients that they're done and they're set to something smaller than or the same size as your VIOs. Um, so here's, here's some examples of the settings that I've used for my server and client by default. Sometimes I will increase them. It just depends on the disk subsystem and what my IO rates are, etc. And the way you find out if you need to increase them is with the FC stat command which will show you whether or not you are actually running out of queue space. So IBM has made some changes in MPIO, and rather than using yesterday PCM, they now want you to use the built-in AIX PCM. That's actually really nice because it makes things like upgrades a lot simpler. There's some best practices documents out there and some migration notes and some articles on resiliency, so I wanted you to have those. You also need to make sure that if you're doing anything like PowerHA or you plan to use LPM, that your disks are all set to no reserve. Do not let them be single path. If you want to change the way the default is set, you can do that with the chdef command that I have in here. Otherwise, you need to make sure that when you add H disks that they are set correctly to no reserve. Anytime that you're using non-IBM storage, you need to make sure that you install the correct drivers for the SAN and for any other disks. You do not want your disks to show up as other SCSI or, or, or other MPIO, you want to make sure they show up as the correct driver. If they don't show up with the correct driver, then you're going to get a queue depth of one on those disks and your performance will be horrendous. So there's just some tips in here for uh, setting the MPIO for the new MPIO setup. Now the LSMPIO command is actually very useful. If I um, look at this H disk one, and I can see that it's an MPIO IBM 27 T6 disk, I can actually run an LSMPIO-QL, and it actually tells me that it's an IBM 2145, that it's a 50 gig LUN, it belongs to the host group P8 NIM, and the volume name is NIM root VG. Now that's all, the P8 NIM and the NIM root VG is stuff I set in the storage subsystem, but what's really nice is that it brings that information across for me, so that I can actually look at it and I can match it up and make sure I'm using the disk that was really assigned to me to use for rootvg. I can also just do an lsmpio-l on the H disk and it will actually show me all of the paths and whether or not they're optimized. I can then use chipath if I want to change priorities for the paths. There's various other versions like the lsmpio-are-l which gives me a very very long report on the with statistics for the paths. And then there's 
a, an additional version that gives some much longer ones. So this is just a couple of things out of the LS MPIO ARE. And you can see it gives me the adapter driver, it gives me the WWPN that it's using, it gives me lists of connection errors, what my adapter driver is, so in my case it's AIXPCM, and so on and so on. You can get a lot of useful detailed information out of that. LS Path has also been updated with some new flags. You can use the dash T, and that will actually give you the path ID at the end, and the dash I actually allows you to get information on a specific path. So if I do an LS path dash I space four, it will give me only information about which disks have a path four. Now, one of the other things that can happen is that you can end up with missing or failed paths. There's a number of reasons why this happens. And once you've done the diagnosis and realized that, well, I'm running LS path on this H disk, I have some missing paths or failed paths, but I still have the correct number of paths, it's just that we swapped out an adapter or something like that, then it's a good thing to clean that up. So what I do is I run this script. I will also look for a grep on defined. And what that script does is it basically builds a new script called removepaths.shell that has all the information in it that will actually do the actual removes. And so I can then check it, make sure I'm not deleting anything I shouldn't be, and remove those paths. And I've used this a lot to clean up systems. It's very, very helpful. And then finally, under storage, I want to talk very quickly about VIOS and NVMe. You can have one or more NVMe devices assigned to your VIO server, and you have 922 and 924 support, up to 14 of them, actually. It's a high-speed flash device. You can use it as a VIO server boot disk. You cannot use it in the shared storage pool, but you can use it for local read cache for the shared storage pool. And you can't assign it to a client as a physical volume. So if you have an NVMe physical volume, you can't use that for vSCSI to assign to a client. So just be a little bit aware of that. Uh, so I tend to use NVMe just for VIO server boot disks. That's really what I use it for. There's a blog on the NVMe, and there's also a lot of information in the latest technical overviews. So I want to talk a little bit about the network to make sure that you understand some of the things related to how the network works. With virtual Ethernet, it, that is basically one LPAR talking to another LPAR through the hypervisor. Now there is a, a switch there. The hypervisor has a switch, and actually you can have multiple of them, but we're just going to use a simple case. So Virtual Ethernet can be used with or without shared Ethernet adapters, with or without VIOs. Like it's basically the ability of two LPARs to talk to each other. Then we have the ability to set up what we call a shared Ethernet adapter. That is basically where the VIO server owns the physical adapter. It talks using virtual Ethernet to the client LPARs, and all of the thing, data that they want to send in and out of the server goes to the VIO server and out through that physical adapter that is linked to the shared Ethernet adapter. Those physical adapters can actually be aggregated together into a link aggregate. So then what you see is you'll see physical adapter to link aggregate to shared Ethernet adapter, then virtual Ethernet out to the clients. We can use 8021Q VLAN tagging so that we can actually make sure that an, a client LPAR only sees the VLANs that it's supposed to see. We can do multiple SCAs. There's a lot of different things we can do. I mentioned earlier on that you should pay attention to entitlement. Your virtual Ethernet and network performance scales by entitlement, not by VPs. And by the way, that applies to the VIO server and the client. So if the VIO server is running above entitlement all the time, it's going to impact all of your client LPARs. If your client LPAR is running above entitlement all the time, it's going to impact its own network. If you've split your VIO servers so that you have a pair of VIO servers handling the network and then a pair of VIO servers handling all your disk I.O., on the network ones, you can disable threading. The reason for having threading is because Ethernet has precedence over storage I.O. by default. By turning off threading, we basically let the, the LAN perform much better because what the threading does is it mixes them together. There's documentation on that that I've given you a link to. You also want to consider turning on large send on the virtual Ethernet adapters and on the SEA. And you should also look at turning on large receive, but you need to read the two links down below because there are some issues, or there were some issues 
with using large receive with Linux and with IBM I. So you need to make sure that you're at the correct levels and settings before you turn that on for those. There were some changes way, way, way back at VIO Server 223. And the only reason I bring this up is because a lot of people are still building control channels. What we used to have to do was have a virtual adapter that had a VLAN on it that was used for the control adapter. And that control channel is actually used for the VIO servers to talk to each other to perform certain functions. Well, as of VIO Server 223, you don't have to define a control channel anymore. Instead, the VIO servers will actually use the default VLAN of 4095, and they will actually build their own virtual control channel to talk to each other. So where before we would use the make dev command here, where we had you know control channel equals ENT6, and we had to build ENT6 with a VLAN. Now we use the new one here where we do not specify a control channel, and when it creates a shared Ethernet adapter, it will also attach a VLAN for the control channel. One other thing you want to be very careful of is when you are defining the adapter that goes external, so that's going to be the virtual adapter you define with external access, you want to make sure that you do not get the priority screwed up. I normally set VIO1 to priority 1, and VIO2 is priority 2. If you give them both the same priority, then you will probably cause a spanning tree loop and you have the potential of taking your network down. So be very, very careful when you do that. So here I'm checking my SCA and control channel. Basically, I do an LS dev and I look at what I have. I, I know from looking at this that most likely ENT4 is going to be the virtual adapter that actually is connected externally. I can tell that ENT8 is my ether channel and ENT9 is my shared ethernet adapter. If I do an int stat on ENT9 and look for control channel, it's telling me that my control channel adapter, our PVID, which is my VLAN, is 4095, and you can see the control channel adapter is ENT4. And ENT4, as I said, is the adapter that goes outside. I can also ask it to tell me what VLANs that, that adapter carries. So I can see that my SEA is carrying VLANs 25 and then 20 through 26. We also need to make sure that we use the correct setup on our switch ports. It turns out that if you don't set up your switch ports for shared Ethernet adapter failover properly, then you can actually have some a very long failback time, and sometimes that means some drop connections. So depending on what kind of switch you have, you may see it called Fort Fast, you may see it called Spanning Tree Edge, but go and have a look at the link here and see if that helps you. I always do SCA failover testing. After I set up a VIO server pair, I will do a number of different things. I'll SSH to the primary and reboot the secondary and see if I lose my SSH connection. Then I do the reverse. Um, I will do a forced failover using standby to make sure that things, strange things don't happen. So you should test all of this before you go production. By default, your VIO server network is not really tuned. So there's some default tunables that you should use. And I use these by de as a minimum, which is basically giving myself a 256K TCP send and receive and, and, and a UDP send and receive. Uh, UDP receive is typically set to about 10 times your UDP send. Even if you think you're not sending UDP traffic, you are because that's what things like DNS and the like use. So I set these on all my systems by default. I increase the TCP ones when I need to, but these are, these are my default starting points. We've talked a little bit about network performance, and I've stressed several times the fact that it scales by entitlement, not by VPs. Things like MTU size makes a big difference. The default MTU is 1500, but you also have the option of using jumbo frames, which is 9000, etc. If you're going to use those kind of settings, you need to make sure that you use the same setting all the way through. You don't want to have uh, jumbo frames inside of the box and then have it go out on the SCA and have to be cut back to 512. There's a lot of packet assembly disassembly goes on. Obviously affected by latency between receiver and sender. It can be affected by firmware on the switch. It can be affected by firmware on the adapters and server. So it's very important to keep those 10 gig E and high performance adapters up to date. You could do some very, very complex networking. You can use the actual switch within the hypervisor and create multiple switches. I've seen that done. I've actually had to work on one that had up to six switches. 
and you can create ether channels you can do all kinds of bridging etc you can do v VIO server load sharing where you put some of the VLANs in different load groups so that VIO1 carries the pr is the primary for certain VLANs, VIO2 is the primary for other VLANs. You can get very, very complex. And then you have options that I'm not going to go into like VNIC and SRIOV. Alexander Paul has some great presentations on these where he goes into a great deal of detail. So there just isn't time in this presentation to cover them. Then there's a couple of different options for load sharing, which I just mentioned. So that's something that's worth looking into. And then finally, we want to get, talk very quickly about monitoring your VIO servers. So we've talked about how it scales by entitlement. So it's critical you have sufficient entitlement. You want to basically have a look, and Enmon shows you quite nicely, and make sure that you're not going above the entitlement on your VIO very much. And you can look for things like virtual context switches. If you see a lot of virtual context switches on a VIO server, then you may very well be running out of entitlement. And the same thing applies with your virtual processes. If you're getting very close to your virtual processes on average, then you probably need to increase entitlement and VPs. Another point, don't ever let your VIO server page. Right? It needs to have enough memory. And that's the thing I see is that you know, somebody will add up all the memory they need for their client for their client LPARs, they'll add up all the cores they need for their client LPARs, and they'll forget that they need to add at least two cores and 16 gig of memory for their VIO servers, plus all the space for hypervisor page tables. So it's not uncommon for people to undersize servers because they don't realize they have to plan for that. I use Enmon to monitor all my LPARs. Basically, this is a 30-minute snap, but I run a 24-hour Enmon, which is the one down here. I kick it off at 11.59 p.m., and I have it right to a file system, and I, and I keep that information. I also use the VIO Server Performance Advisor because that will report on the SCAs. And then a couple of things that we have on the HMC, if you're not aware of it, you can actually turn on monitoring. You have to go into each LPAR and, and tell it that it's allowed to be monitored. And then you turn on the monitoring at the HMC, and now you can get graphs on processor utilization, um, network traffic, storage traffic. You can drill down on any of those. So you can drill down here on my network traffic by, by VIO server. So it gives you a view from the HMC, and then you can actually drill down literally by adapter. You can also do what we call shared processor pool monitoring. And shared processor pool monitoring is where we are actually looking at all of the LPARs as a whole. So if you're looking at the Enmon Analyzer as an example, and you look at the LPAR tab, it's only going to be valid if you have this turned on for all the LPARs. The same with when you're on LPAR stat, there's an APP column, which is the available cause in the pool. That's only going to be valid if everybody has allowed performance information collection turned on. And this is what the LPAR tab looks like. So in this particular case, you can see that I, my physical CPUs are under my entitlement quite nicely. They never really go above it apart from one tiny little spike. So this looks pretty healthy to me. What you don't want to see is this blue line up above that uh, golden line. You can also get NPIV statistics in the more recent versions of, NPI, of VIO server. You can actually run the FC stack command and you can give it the worldwide port number and the fiber adapter port and it will give you detailed statistics. And there's a number of new flags on FC stat that you can use to get some more detail. On the VIO, you can run the FC stat dash client, and it will actually list all of the clients for that VIO, and it will tell you how many requests, what the worldwide port numbers are. It will give you the DMA errors and and you know any in, in number of invites, number of outbites, etc. So that can be very useful as well when you're trying to look at things. For your shared Ethernet adapter, you can get SEA stats. And in fact, you can also get failover stats, and there's information in these links on how to do that. One of the things that you do want to look at is this netstat-v. When you're looking at a netstat-v and you get to your shared Ethernet adapter, or actually any of your virtual adapters, if you see the things in red, packets dropped, no resource errors, and hypervisor receive failures, then you are probably running out of buffers. Now remember, this is since boot, so you want to take a couple of snaps a distance apart and then compare them. So in this case here, I scroll down and I see my buffers and I see min and max. And if you notice, 
where I have min and max, I have max allocated, and for the smalls is showing as 2048, which is the same as the max buffers. That tells me that the buffer I'm running out of that's causing all those drops is my small buffers. The solution I have is that I would simply increase my max buffer small to 4096. Now, when I do that, I typically will increase my minimum buffers. And the reason that I increase the minimum buffers is because what I don't want to have happening is a lot of growing and shrinking. So if the system's quiet for a while, it'll drop back down to 512. And then if I get a spike of traffic, there's a latency while it spins up all the buffers. IBM more in more recent times has changed it so that the setting is instead of being uh, buff mode equals min, they've changed it to buff mode equals max min, which means it doesn't matter what you have here. It will always allocate maximum buffers. And so max allocator will always show maximum buffers. And the challenge with that is then you don't know when, when you need to increase them. I tend to have a policy now where I will increase my max buffers. I change it back to buff mode min, but I set my, my minimum buffers much closer to the maximum, maybe 80% or 90%. And then I can look at max allocated and see if I have a problem. It's up to you whether you do that or not. That's what this slide is really talking about is, you know, what the settings where here's where I set all my maximums, etc. It's a chdev command, which means it's a reboot to, to activate it. Then finally, we have the part command. I'm not going to go into the details of that. There's a number of slides, but what part does is it grabs VIO specifics, statistics, and creates an XML file that you can look at. At this point, I want to thank you for attending and listening to the session. If you have any questions, you know, feel free to send them to me, and please complete the session evaluation. I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. I do have the presentation uploaded and it will also be on the conference website. Thank you and stay safe.